Joining me now on the next Film School podcast, a returning guest. I hope it will not be the last time he comes on. I hope he is not under some kind of embargo <laughs> from talking about the team that he covered for 23 years. I'm just I'm going to start by by introducing you this way. He covered this basketball team for 23 years, most of them very bad. He decides to hang him up. He goes to Florida <laughs> and a hurricane hits Florida. I'm not I'm not <laughs> saying no coincidence there, right? <laughs> Mark Berman, uh, I, I, can I still call you Berman of the Post? Is there, or I guess I can. Yeah, I'm still uh, on the payroll until next week, so uh, <laughs> you can. Uh, but after that, no. <laughs> after that, who, who, who made the uh, Jalen Rose? Keep getting them checks um, for one more week. You, you get the check. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Knicks, but I, I, I have to start with you, if that's okay. Um, you don't see. Beat reporters stick on a beat often for 23 years. And we're talking about other beats that are not this beat. And this beat is a different animal. And I think you'd be, you probably know that better than anybody. Um, how'd you do it? I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, yeah, listen, uh, when I announced my resignation to the staff of the post, I got so many plaudits saying I deserved a, a Purple Heart and just an amazing uh, amount of years to be covering a team that is so difficult to cover with their uh, media policies. So uh, I just love journalism and I, I do love the Knicks franchise and I love the passion of the fans. And to be honest, I think it's the fans that got me through this. Uh, you're never writing... Uh, into a vacuum. I'm told from some people who write about the Nets that they feel like no one's paying attention, even during the KD Kyrie Harden uh, era. So the fans are just unbelievable. And you mentioned 23 seasons uh, early on uh, that we got out of the first round, the Knicks got out of the first round, uh, you know, early on in my tenure, but uh, not uh, for the longest uh, time. Well, 2013 was the last time, yep. but the, the fans, despite the down years, they were still reading and my page views were in the millions and millions, you know, one of my editors uh, gave a statistic, which I couldn't believe on how many page views I had uh, since 2013. And it was very flattering that he crunched the numbers. The Knicks fans are amazing. Uh, they really are considering how much losing this franchise has done uh, since well, I started in 1999, 2000. That was yep. good. But since 2001, uh, when Jeff Van Gundy resigned. Yes. The last uh, conference finals appearance was your very first year yeah. on the beat. Um, I imagine after that first. Well, uh, let me ask you. Was how early were there signs for you that your coverage of this team may change from how it was in that first, uh, you know, our very successful season? I mean, I never ima imagined uh, the the crash. The irony is I wrote a book after Ewing's last season. Uh, it was called, it was the first season without Ewing. It was yeah. called Living Without You, The Crash of the Post-Ewing Knicks. And I figured it would just be temporary. I didn't realize how uh, poetic that title would become. I, I just cannot imagine the dysfunction. No one realized how bad an owner James Dolan was when I took over in 99, 2000. He's proven to make one horrible decision after another. And now in his latest uh, obsession, uh, he's cracking down on the media like he's never done before. I think, I don't know what's going on in my last column. I said, maybe he's just getting even crustier in his old age. He's 67 now, but it's really just almost despicable at what the media policy looks like at this moment with no press conference with the press corps for Jalen Brunson or for RJ Barrett. And who knows what will happen in the future, but it's a terrible precedent. 
it well, it's funny you say precedent because it is somewhat unprecedented, if not outright unprecedented, at least in this league where where a lot of teams, um, quite frankly, and I, and I don't know if I'm saying anything untoward towards the people that do this, but I feel like you read some beat reporters coverage of their teams and it is like, you know, maybe not, they're not outright waving the pom poms, but they are unequivocally pro whatever, you know, pick pick your your small market team and then you know here there is this antagonistic relationship and i'm i'm going to actually direct it back to what you you said about the fans because it has come to the point as you i know you see this on twitter where a lot of fans don't blame the knicks for the media policy but they blame you and you know steph and fred and like oh do you can what would you say to to those folks that is frustrating when the fans don't recognize how wrong it is. To me, the Knicks look like they're afraid. Uh, Leon Rose is afraid of the press right now. He hasn't spoken to the press in over a year. And the fans are like, good for him. You guys don't treat him well enough. But it comes off as looking weak and cowardly and afraid, as I said. And what are they hiding? Uh, Listen, the MSG Network interview by Alan Hahn uh, wasn't terrible. I mean, I thought he asked a lot of good questions. He asked one inaccurate one saying there was a report that Cam Reddish had requested a trade. I have not never written that. I said I reported exclusively that he prefers a change of scenery. He's concerned about his role. He'd like a bigger role. Uh, elsewhere, but he, I did not write. He requested a trade, but, uh, getting back to the point, uh, Leon has to talk to the to the media. Uh, otherwise, it looks bad. And I'm, I don't know if these fans on Twitter that uh, support Leon in this is representative of the entire Knicks fan base. But I am disappointed and surprised when I see people come at me saying you guys deserve to be shunned. I, I don't think there's any you could say anything. And I think there's going to be a segment of especially Knicks fans, because there's so many of them around the world and they so many different types of people from all over the place. You're not going to be able to characterize like that. Everybody's in agreement, even the stuff that's going on now with like, you know, Tibbs and Noby and Randall. It's like, there's people who are like, Hey, Tibbs is right. You know, other people who are like, Tibbs should lose his job. I, I, I struggle with it quite frankly, because in full disclosure, like I used to be one of the people who are like, man, why are they always so hard on us? Right. It's like, we have a bad enough. Our team stinks. And then I kind of got to see how the sausage is made. And I'm like, well, you know, you guys are just you're reporting. Now, that said, it does still come up until the end. It came across at times like you could be needling them a little bit. What would you say to that, Mr. Berman? Uh, Listen, I'm only human. And, uh, (laughs) you know, we try to be as objective as possible. But I mean, it's been so egregious. with how they've treated us, uh, you know, we try to be objective, but listen, I wrote a RJ Barrett story that some thought was, was unfair. I'm just quoting a very important, uh, GM who sees holes in his game. And I wrote to it and, and listen, if I didn't think that was representative, I've spoken to a lot of scouts across the couple of years and they, a lot of scouts, feel that RJ may have a ceiling that is below all-star level. Uh, You know, even some members of the Knicks organization were concerned of uh, taking him at three, thought maybe you trade back and get another player. Scott Perry was the one that drove that pick through. He said, we're not trading back. We are getting RJ Barrett. But listen, if I, I would not print a, wild opinion about R.J. Barrett if I didn't feel it was representative of what the rest of the league believes. And and credit to you, because even before uh, Ian came out with his report, uh, who I I hear you've been referring to the hurricane as as, uh, Hurricane Bankley, but we (laughs) don't have to go there. Um, Even, you know, even Ian, before he came out with the report that there's some decision makers who, you know, may, may be thinking about including RJ in a Mitchell trade, you had that snippet in the, your article about, Hey, you know what? Some of them may favor Grimes even a little bit more than Barrett. So you were on that and that sent people, a lot of people off the deep end. 
because and it reminded me of so many times when, again, in my maybe younger days where I would read your stories and I'd be like this SOB, like, how dare he say this, that whatever it was. And then I don't know if it's maybe because I've been doing this too long, but now you kind of look at it and you're like, well, this is a this is an organization with a lot of opinions. It's been a lot of decision makers. There's a lot of decision makers now, and as you know better than anyone, there's always been a lot of people whose voices are there. So, you know, I, I, the kind of the older I get, I, I look back and I'm like, man, I I feel a little bit bad about some of the some of the criticisms, you know, along the way. Yeah, I mean, these are when I write something, I'm not just writing it off the top of my head and it Mark Berman's opinion. I think I mean, that's what I'm, some people think. Right. I, yeah, I know. So. I know. Uh, listen, when it comes to Quentin Grimes, there are, you know, the coaches love him. I mean, obviously right now he's got a sore foot yeah. and he had the knee thing last season. So you start to wonder about his durability a little bit right this moment. But they just love the fact that he's such a great defender and mm-hmm. can shoot the three also. I mean, he can't do some of the things RJ does, but the whole matter of RJ was, do we want to give him a max rookie extension? They did not and did not. And they, did. Uh, they, they did want to and they didn't. And it's one hundred seven million dollars guaranteed. Uh, a lot of incentives there that could bring it to one twenty, but I don't think it will because a lot of it is all NBA and all star yeah. and all defense. So. Listen. RJ obviously is the better player right now, but they feel that Quentin for the role they would want him as, as a great defender and three point shooter, you know, they didn't want to put him in that Donovan Mitchell deal, but listen, RJ still can get better. He's obviously got some holes in his game, but he's got a great mentality and to be positive, you know, some scouts say the great thing about RJ, he's got an incredible amount of confidence in himself. Swagger. He could shoot one for 10 in the first half and then go off in the second half. So that's some of the, uh, you know, great things about RJ. And I put that in the story, but everyone wants to focus on what did Mark Berman write negatively about RJ Barrett? Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah. Not, not the positive part of the story, but the negative part. Yeah. And I, I, you know, and I've thought a lot about why, because again, I'm, I, I include myself. That's, that's what I do. I look for the most negative line in the story and, and it's what I always gravitate. And I wonder if that's something about us as New Yorkers or. Yeah. I think it's a New York thing. It's a New York we thing. Look for the negative. In Florida, it's a little different. Yes, it is. <laughs> my, my, my dad lives not, not far from where you are now. So I know, I know that area well. Um, speaking of engendering negative reactions, um, you have been over the last couple of years, I think, christened the Thibodeau Whisperer as someone who um, I'm, I'm not saying what I what I believe. Some people say some people say Tibbs get, you know, gives his information to or what he wants out there to Mark. Um, what do you think about Tibbs as a coach and how he's handling things right now for an organization that has, I think, clearly told him, go win games. But there's a lot of people out there who feel like, hey, there's other priorities here, you know, including developing young players and this and that. How, how do you think he's doing? I think it's the best thing that Leon Rose has done because it was all about relationships there. If you remember, Leon comes in and says, I have relationships across the league. It's going to help us. Okay. Well, so far... It didn't help in the Donovan Mitchell situation, but it helped in getting Thibodeau. He was not coming to New York to work under James Dolan unless Leon Rose was there. And at the All-Star break, and I believe I wrote it pretty strongly, not then, but at the end of the season, that several decision makers wanted Thibodeau fired at the All-Star break. Leon, It was Wes, right? I forget if I apologize. I forget if it was you that wrote Wes or if it was somebody else. But I remember his his name came up. Uh, Well, several, not just him. uh, But Leon Rose said, no, no way. Uh, So best thing Leon has done. Listen, my only uh, concern with Thibodeau, and, and it's just one of my pet peeves, is leaving players, key players, starters in the game, 20 points up or 20 points down. They're still out there with three minutes left. Uh, I just don't understand why he does that. The whole thing about playing young players, I still don't get it. If Obi Toppin was playing better earlier in the season, he would have played more. But yes, he was rolling with Julius. Julius was second team all NBA. Yeah. Tom felt 
He's going to turn it around. We saw it in uh, 2020-21. He just kept rolling with him, thinking it's going to change. And he did have a big, uh, strong stretch uh, late in the winter, but it was too late to turn the tide of public opinion. But Obi struggled from the three-point line. There was a point he was shooting under 20%. It got and pretty his low. Defense, his team defense, he doesn't have a good defensive IQ. Uh, the coaching staff is concerned about that. That's what's going to hold him back this season in terms of getting minutes. If Julius is rolling again and OB isn't hitting his three-point shot, OB's not going to be playing more than 15 minutes a night. Uh you know, a lot. Listen, if Julius is what he was last season in terms of being uh, too selfish, over dribbling, turning the ball over, be, having a bad body language, sure, all the we things. Will see, yeah. We will see Obi Toppin, but I think you think so. Gonna, yeah, I think we're going to see. But but again, Obi's got to be hitting that three point shot. That's a big thing for Tom, and it's a big thing about his team defense. Uh, but playing the young players. Yeah, I would have liked to see more of Miles McBride. I never understood after his great game against Houston when he replaced Derrick Rose and then he got COVID and he came back and he had a bad game against Toronto and then we barely saw him again. Didn't understand that. But he, he's trying to win. And Tom Thibodeau, no one works harder in the league than Tom Thibodeau. He's looking at the film over every game. He He's looked at every single game from last season. So. He's going to play no matter what your age, the guy he thinks is going to help the team win. On that note, one more, and then I, I want to just go, go back in time a little bit before I let you go. Do you think there is an issue with this franchise right now in terms of knowing where they are, where they're coming from, where they're more importantly, where they're going and, and how they want to get there? Or do you think they're, I don't want to say flying by the seat of their pants, but there is a little, you know, uncertainty with like where, you know, what the, what the priorities are, so to speak. Well, that was the one uh, weak spot of the Leon Rose, Alan Hahn interview. There wasn't a, any type of big picture question about what's the timetable for a championship or, you know, what's the goal of this season. And, you know, Leon had the quote about, you know, how happy he was in the off season, yet the number one, uh, priority of of trading for Donovan Mitchell yeah. uh, collapsed, and I believe they didn't make the strongest offer that they were willing to make because Danny Ainge just got tired of dealing with them. They had enough time to make a strong offer, and they got wrapped up in Cleveland negotiations. So uh, the timetable, Leon's got to talk to the press and talk about when he envisions, you know, vying for the championship. Obviously, they're going to be eyeing a Devin Booker and a Shea Gilgis Alexander. They need to, they know they need to make another big move. This isn't their team that's going to compete for a top four, even. So they have that draft capital that they want to use in a big trade. And they're just waiting. Who knows? Maybe Donovan Mitchell in a year will hate <laughs> the winter of the winters of Cleveland and oh. uh, ask out. But it is uncertain on what Leon's master plan is, and it's it's been unstated. Um, okay, couple. I'm going to try for these to be quick hitters, but if you need to take some time to think, by all means. Um, who was your favorite coach to cover here? You know, it's funny. Um, I was texting with Van Gundy a few days ago. He wished me well, and I only had a, a one full season, and then. A, uh, you know, a month and Nine a half. Games, ten games. Second. Yeah, 10 yeah. games in a training camp. But I said to him that in that, in that short time, I felt I learned, I think it was 14 coaches total. And I said to him that I, I felt I learned more from you in that short time than the other coaches. Although I love dealing with Dan Tony. He was, he was a really great guy to, to work with. And Larry Brown, I learned a lot from him too. What, what was the exact question? Was it about? Oh, coaching? no. Who's your, just, you, I think you answered who's your favorite coach to cover. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. So, and, and Dan Tony was, was great. And Tom, you know, I wish the pandemic hadn't hit us just as Tom took over because the amount of time we've been able to talk to him off the record, like we used to do when he was here as an assistant, 
you know, we haven't been able to chit chat as much, you know, around the court and stuff with all the restrictions, but Tom's a lot of fun. And I see him ever since he got to the Knicks, he smiles a lot more. He seems a lot more relaxed in Minnesota. The media did not like him in Minnesota and he was very serious and it was just too much, but uh, he's really relaxed here. You know, he knows the landscape. He knows the New York media. So uh, it's good to see that he seems to be enjoying himself. Although he got a little testy today. When I was about to say, <laughs> I don't know how much he was enjoying himself today. Uh, four or five tandem. Yeah. Um, a couple more then I know you got to go. Uh, is there a player or a couple of players that stand out to you as someone who you thought really took the time to give you like real deeper insight than just like, we know the players you just, they're going to give their sound bite and get out of here. Who does anyone stand up? Well, you know, Steph, Stefan Marbury would call me a lot. You know, we, he kind of became, we became close, uh, but it was, you know, a, a tumultuous reign. So he was, he was looking for some reporter that would hear him out off the record. And oh wow. so I really appreciated our relationship. It was probably before you, you know, I remember Steph. really do it, but yeah, but Steph was great, but listen, I enjoyed Porzingis a lot. It was his brother who was the issue. Although his brother was great the first year and then his brother turned and he just became a different person. Uh, you know, Carmelo was Excellent. Even though we had to wait for him for an hour in the locker room, I never saw him turn uh, like any question you could ask Carmelo. He'd answer it. He would never give you a snide remark. He was so nice. Amare was always a gentleman in that locker room. I really enjoyed covering Amare. Luttrell, before he sued me, was great, too. And then we got into uh, a little lawsuit action. Um, Derek Rose. One of my favorites, you know, we'll be, well, I won't be back in the locker room, but thankfully the other reporters will be back in the locker room and Derek before a game during that pregame access, he's always by his locker. Any question you want to ask him, he's there for it. We missed him during this pandemic, uh, not being able to do that, but there's been, I think Elias sports bureau gave me the total of players I've covered and it was 50. Yeah. It was in my final column. I think it was 250 players, but those are the big standouts. There were some guys who didn't like me. I know Tim Hardaway Jr. I I never thought I wrote anything that badly about him, but he kind of hated me. And he would like make who can hate who can hate a face like like this. (laughs) But yeah, Tim was tough. And uh, you know, RJ Barrett and I go back and forth, but uh, I think it's mostly in good fun. You know, RJ has especially last season, would say some things not on camera that or the zoom or whatever, but uh, yeah, he, he was a little rough for, uh, last season. Well, if RJ uh, eventually wins, you know, his MVP and he dedicates it to Mark Furman, <laughs> we'll, we'll know that you guys had a special bond. Uh, la- last one. I know this is going to be tough, but um, do you have a game or, or a memory of covering this team that stands out? Yeah. And in, I've said this before, even though it seems so recent, because of the pandemic, but that game one mm-hmm. of the playoffs against Atlanta, when there were 16,000 fans in there chanting, let's go Knicks 40 minutes before tip off, everyone was back together again. It just felt like such a great party. You know, the Knicks lost in the final seconds on the Trey Young drive, but yeah. that night really sticks with me. I, I guess it was because it was the pandemic and it just felt like such a historic night, like the pandemic had finally eased up and the sound of the garden. I don't remember it ever louder, even in 2000 during the 2000 playoffs. Really? I don't remember because a bunch of us left the garden. Our ears were ringing because it was oh. constant from 45 minutes before tip off to the final buzzer when Trey pretty much shut up the crowd, <laughs> but our ears were ringing uh, that night uh, when it was over. And I just don't even remember that in 2000. Um, Mark, I, I, after, after Mike Francesa retired, he kept going on Bill Simmons podcast to like spout his thoughts on things. If you would like to make this your version (laughs) of the Bill Simmons podcast and come on here and spout your thoughts about the Knicks, um, it is an open invitation. Uh, I want to say in front of, for everybody who's listening, um, 
I'm not going to go full into detail on some of the kindnesses that you've done and towards me over the years. Uh, but suffice it to say, uh, you've been a massive help. Uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I can't thank you enough for all of that. And, uh, you know, I hope, hope retirement treats you well. Yeah. Thanks so much. And Jonathan, you, you do such a great job and you built uh, such a big fan base. It's, it's really impressive. I will have to say, and, thanks. uh, you know, a, a lot of guys on the beat also, you know, they probably never admit it as strongly as I do, but they they definitely respect the the amount of attention you've been able to garner. And uh, it, it's a real impressive thing. I, and I'm, and you're a great guy. And, and no. yeah, I, I don't know how many times you'll be at the garden in the season, but, you know, not seeing you, I didn't see you that much last season, you know, as much as I would have liked. And this I became, I, I, you know, where I, where it became a work from home thing to, to cover this team with the live streams afterwards and everything. So, yeah, you yeah. know, right, we'll right, see right. if that changes. Right. But uh, again, thanks so much for the offer. And I'll definitely think about it uh, coming back and uh, popping in once in a while uh, to talk about the Knicks and, you know, maybe the Miami Heat. If the Knicks and the Heat are in a playoff uh, situation, you got to now become. <laughs> the Pat Riley whisperer. That is the that is the next step for Mark Berman. Yeah. It's the only. Well, Pat and I know each other. He's a giant Springsteen fan, so we've seen okay. each other at Springsteen concerts, and uh, yeah, maybe I'll see him. I'll be going Springsteen's opening in Tampa uh, this oh. year, and I have a feeling Pat will be there, and I'll be in Tampa and the Orlando show. So, Man, what's, what's Pat like at a Springsteen concert? I can't even. Uh, he, he's that. just a giant fan, and. and you know, he's also a big Jimmy Buffett fan, but I think yeah. Bruce became number one for him. And yeah. Bruce has invited him backstage and they have a nice little relationship right now. I need a picture of you, the boss. and <laughs> oh, I love that. And I Riley. Like that there one. you go. Uh, Mark Berman, one of a kind, my man. Thank you. All right, Jonathan. Thank you so much.